second, everyone, this is lesson one. This is on advanced hemodynamic and critical care biochemistry concepts. So I really, really, really enjoy these courses. I know when I was first starting in the ICU, I thoroughly enjoyed my critical care or hemodynamic course. It was very brief and we only got to do it once. So I really wanted to make sure that this was in this platform. So then if you wanted to, you could rewatch it as many times as you wanted, or if there's something you wanted to review, you could always come back to it. So in this lesson, we will be going through hemodynamic concepts like preload, afterload, and contractility, the hemodynamic monitoring values, receptors, and hemodynamically stable patient intervention manipulation. All right, so first to start out with the hemodynamic concepts. So cardiac output is liters per minute, and this is heart rate times your stroke volume. So then going one step further, your cardiac index equals the cardiac output over your body surface area. Your contractility is the force that the heart beats, so that's inotropy. So we, are, we will learn about positive inotropes and negative inotropes. So either one will either increase or decrease the force of which the heart can beat. So what can cause low cardiac output? So that's poor left ventricular filling or ejection. So going back up to the cardiac index. So this is the cardiac output based on the patient's body surface area. So this means it's a lot more specific to the specific patient. So let's just say you have a patient who is 400 pounds versus a patient who is 98 pounds. Their cardiac output may be similar. However, when you take into consideration the, bar, the body surface area of a 400 pound person compared to a 98 pound person, your cardiac index will vary significantly. This is why it's important to monitor cardiac index and the normal index we like to see is usually above two in the ICU. However, a good goal to go by is 2.5 to four liters per minute per meter squared. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that is pumped out by the ventricles with each heartbeat. So what are things that affect this amount of blood? So that would be our preload or the amount of volume that is going into our heart that will then be pumped out with each heartbeat. So how do we measure stroke volume? So there's different ways to do this. On the right ventricular preload, we measure that by our CVP. That's something you are probably pretty familiar with already. And then on the left side, we have our PAD or a PCWP, which is our pulmonary artery diastolic pressure and our pulmonary capillary wedge pressures. We'll get more into the actual values of these moving on into the lesson here. All right, another thing I want you guys to know is the Frank Starling's law curve and concept. So over here on the right side here, this is our Frank Starling's law curve. So essentially the heart muscle fibers can only stretch so far before they lose their elastic recoil. So I want you to kind of put your hands together and kind of so interlace all your, your fingers together. I want you to imagine that across your hands here, you have a whole bunch of rubber bands. And so you can kind of play with that. So you will envision in your mind, your hands being covered in rubber bands. And so as the heart pumps or as your hands pump together, these rubber bands are on the hand. So when you pull out, you will have more elasticity. And then that is what helps bring the hands closer together or what closes the ventricles. So why this is so important is that your rubber bands can only stretch for so long before they lose their elastic recoil, right? So our heart fibers are the exact same way. So that's how we can get these very boggy ventricles and these non-compliant ventricles and hearts that, that get so big, so enlarged where they're just boggy and they don't contract down well together. So that's why it's important. So there's a certain amount of preload or the, the volume that fills the heart inside of those ventricles that it gets to a certain point where it can't take any more volume that it stretches out those fibers so far where it does not do a good job of recoil. So therefore your index or your cardiac output will decrease. Moving on to the next concept here, this is our stroke volume variance. This is the amount of variability in between each heartbeat with the amount of volume that is within it. So the variability in stroke volume between each heartbeat. Normal stroke volume is usually anywhere from 60 to 100. If your stroke volume, so I'm not talking about stroke volume variance, but if your stroke volume is less than 60, this means your patient needs some more volume typically. The less variability in the stroke volume amount in between each heartbeat. So let's just say one heart beats 40, one heart beats 60, one heart beats 30, one heart beats 50, one heart beats 20, one heart beat is 
is 80. All those are very variable numbers. And the more variable, this means the, the patient is compromised and the patient has a low volume status. So that means you need to tank up your pressures or tank up or add more volume to increase your preload. So then you will have less variability. Now on the other end, so if you have less variable, so let's just say your stroke volume is 60, 70, 75, 75, 70, 70, 75, and is really consistent, that means that your stroke volume is less variable or has less variance. So this number is categorized by a percentage. So the higher the percentage of the variance means the higher or more variable your stroke volume variance is, the more fluid your patient will probably need. Now on the other end, if you have a low stroke volume variance number, that means you have less variance or that means that that patient's fluid volume is more stable. Now, something else I want you guys to know that with stroke volume variance, so this is again is a percentage of the variability, but also when you're thinking about what's going on inside of the heart as far or inside of the thoracic cavity, you know, you have your heart, you have your lungs, you have a whole bunch of other things in there, right? So when you have different pressures with your vents, you are, or you will have different pressure exerted onto your heart and onto your, to your superior and inferior vena cava, which will impact the amount of blood that can get into the heart and will affect the overall stroke volume. The normal range for stroke volume variance for a patient who is vented is 10 to 13. So if the number is higher than 13, your number or your variance or your stroke volume variance is too high. So they need more fluid because they are not adequately fluid compensated. Now, if your stroke volume variance is under 10 to 13%, you probably have adequate fluid volume. Another good way to remember this is if your stroke volume variance is high, or if you have high variability within your stroke volume, your patient is dry. Okay, moving on to afterload. I want you guys to kind of visualize the heart and the aorta and everything after that there, right? So we are now thinking about what is happening after the ventricles are pumping the blood out. So this is what the, what the heart has to pump against, right? So there's SVR and PVR. So PVR is your pulmonary vascular resistance, but for this course, we will stick to our systemic vascular resistance. So this systemic vascular resistance is what the ventricles have to pump against, right? So our heart is pumping against either normal veins that aren't vasodilated or constricted, or they're pushing against really, 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 really tight, narrow vasoconstricted veins or big, wide vasodilated veins. So what do you think is going to be harder for your heart to pump against? Do you think your heart is going to have an easier or harder time pumping against narrow pipes or wide pipes? If you answered narrow pipes, it's definitely going to have a harder time pumping against narrow pipes, right? So we want the SVR to be normal. So a normal systemic vascular resistance is usually anywhere from 800 to 1200 dynes per second per centimeter to the fifth, okay? So let's just think of the number of normal from 800 to 1200. So in shock, so low SVR, so numbers in the 400s, 500s, this means your patient has a whole bunch of vasodilation going on. And so therefore, you know, so let's just think of anaphylactic shock or shock states, right? So your vessels here are vasodilated to the max, right? And so this means you need, so this means the heart would, would need less squeeze to push against this. However, <laughs> you definitely want to get those vessels constricted more constricted to the normal section so that you can maintain your, your blood pressure, right? Now on the opposite, when, you're, when your vessels are super clamped down or vasoconstricted, your heart, it's going to, your heart's gonna have a really hard time pushing against this. So let's just say your SVR is like 1800 or 2000, right? Some crazy number that's way up there. Your heart's going to have a hard time pumping against that. So we need to make sure that our SVR is adequate within our 800 to 1200 range. So our heart isn't working too hard against too constricted of vessels. SVR 
is 400 or 500, right? So this is low SVR. So this means you need squeeze on your vessels to make it more normal, right? So we need to squeeze on this to make it look like this. And so therefore our pressures will come up. Now, if we need the opposite for veins are too constricted, then we need to open them up a little bit. So then they look normal again. So that's SVR. And so what are things that affect our afterload or this resistance within our vessels, right? So we want to think about the first thing that our heart has to pump against, right? So this is our aorta, right? So for increased afterload, so when our numbers are too high or when our vessels are too constricted, right? Aortic stenosis, peripheral artery constriction, hypertension, and vasopressors. So yes, yeah, so if you do have your patient on a good amount of, of vasopressors, and if they are actually working, you will see high afterload states. Now, so, so sometimes your pressors aren't working no matter what you are doing. So this isn't an always rule here, but when your vasopressors do work, you will see a higher or in either corrected or over high SVR number indicating that your vasopressors are actually constricting the vessels to help support your blood pressure. If those vasopressors were not on, if you have a shock state going on, you would probably see something like this within your vessels and that will obviously tank your pressures. So this is where these concepts are, will all kind of come together here. Now, so what are things that decrease our afterload or decrease the, or decrease what the heart has to pump again? So these are low afterload or vasodilation states. So these are things like we've been talking about, like hypovolemia, shock and sepsis, and the vasodilation medications, but we will be getting into that here shortly as well. All right, moving on to SVO2 and SCVO2. And so these all have to do with oxygen demand and consumption. So SVO2 is a mixed venous gas. So this is pulled from the PA catheter uh, right out of the right ventricle here. And the goal for SVO2 is 60 to 80%. So our mixed gases, so what we want our mixed O2 to be is 60 to 80%. You don't want it too high. You don't want it too low. We want it to be 60 to 80. Now our central venous gas so our SCVO2, so this is our central venous gas. So this is what we pull from our PIC or our CVC. And so this is usually two to 3% lower than the SVO2. So if you look here in, in the picture, so if you think about where you know, your pulmonary artery catheter is pulling from, from about here versus here, right? So it depends on where the blood is, really will depend on the O2 amount, but roughly your SCVO2 is two to three lower than your SVO2. That's just a really good way to remember that. Or, you know, that's just a really good estimate. So if you don't have a PA catheter in, but you do have a CVC or a PIC line, if you want to know your mixed venous gas, you can pull a central venous gas. So you know what oxygen demand and consumption is actually occurring. And so this helps to indicate how much oxygen the body and cells need versus what is utilized by the body. And this, and this is really important, septic stages and other shock stages. So you know what is happening at the cellular level within your patient. Okay, so there is a whole bunch of numbers and a whole bunch of monitoring values that you should know. I will put, I, I didn't wanna put all the numbers onto these slides. I didn't want you to feel like you had to write all these numbers down. I will be adding a downloadable list of all the normal ranges for these numbers. So then you can have them, but I didn't want to focus on the numbers so much while I was teaching it. I wanted to teach you the concept. Then once you understand the concept, you can memorize the number. That's how you should really be doing things here. Don't memorize things. I want you guys to really understand these things because the more you understand these, these concepts and how everything works together, the easier it will be to actually apply it when you get to learn to the, when you get to learn the medications. So the basic hemodynamic monitoring values are things like heart rate, blood pressure, MAP, and CBP, and then all the complex things here. So these are things uh, just about in order of what we talked about, cardiac output and index, or SVR, and our PVR, um, stroke volume, stroke volume variance, mixed and central venous gases, and then our pulmonary artery and capillary occlusive wedge pressure. So don't forget that I will have these posted. I will give you the reference ranges. Most references are a little bit different, but we will go by the averages that I've been seeing. 
All right, moving on to receptors. So a little bit about my background is that I initially for my undergrad was a biochemistry and molecular biology major, but then I fell in love with the bed signs. So anyways, I have a specific passion for biochemistry. So anyways, so in our cells, we have all these different kinds of receptors. And so then we have over here what's coming into these receptors. So these are effectors or our medications. So our medications have specific receptors that that they are going to in order to invoke a certain action, right? So we have our mechanisms of action within our medication, and this is basically how it happens. So you have the hormones or the effectors or the specific medications, whatever they're made out of, <laughs> right? So we're thinking about, about this conceptually. We have our medications that bind onto specific receptors in order to invoke a specific response. All right, moving on to adrenergic receptors. So these are our alpha and beta receptors. So these are the receptors that are targets of many catecholamines such as norepinephrine and epinephrine that are produced by the body. But when we're talking about patients who are in septic shock or, or whatever issue they have in the ICU and when they have drips like epi or norepinephrine, these are, are the receptors that these medications are working on. So we'll talk about this more when we talk about the each specific uh, ICU drip separately, but just for the concept. So the alpha receptors increase our blood pressure. So alpha receptors, basal constrict our vessels and our arterioles. Okay, moving on to beta. So you have, so a good way to remember this simply for beta one versus beta two. So you have one heart and you have two lungs, right? So the beta-1 receptors are found in the heart muscle, and when they are acted on, these increase heart rate or increase our contractility. Now for beta-2, right, we have two lungs. This is, so these receptors are responsible for coronary and peripheral dilation and also for bronchodilation. The next set of receptors that we will be going over are the dopaminergic or DA or DM, and these are, re these are responsible for renal and mesenteric vasodilation. All right, so for hemodynamically stable patient intervention manipulation. So that's a really, really, really long title, right? So, but so before we start giving these patients basal active medications that, that will either increase or decrease their blood pressure, we need to make sure that our, our volume status is optimized. If our volume, if our blood pressure is too low, but our CVP is normal and our heart rate is normal, what are we going to give? If our CVP is normal, that means our preload is adequate, which means we have enough fluid volume, right? So therefore we would give pressors. But if your blood pressure is low, but your CVP is low, you would give fluid first and then start your vasoactive medications, such as the presser. Always make sure that your patient is fluid optimized before you start giving them blood pressure medications. So the vasopressors that we will be going over are levofed, neosinephrine, vasopressin, and the positive inotropes that we will be going through in another lesson are epinephrine, dobutamine, dopamine, and milrinone. It's very important for you guys to understand the basic biochemistry of the medications that you are using. And it's a very, it's a much easier way to actually understand what's actually happening or why you will need specific medications. So sometimes people say, oh, well, I don't need to know biochemistry because I'm not a physician. Well, I will respectfully challenge that because you are, you are their bedside nurse, you are their advocate. So I do believe you should have a basic understanding of the mechanism of action of these basal active medications that you will be using to save their lives. So take pride in what you do, take pride in all this information, and we will get into more of this into the subsequent lessons that have these specific medications in them. All right, and as always guys, if you ever have any questions regarding any of the information that I'm talking about, and in case if I say something <laughs> twisted, um, I do my best to make sure I, I edit through everything in case if I misspeak, but again, we are nurses, we are humans, educators, we are human. So if you have questions on any of the content, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to get you in the right direction or, or add another lesson on hemodynamics in order to further a specific concept that you guys are looking for. All right, I will see you in the next lesson, which is central nervous system.
pharmacology. Thanks, guys.